and thank you everyone for coming out today. It's a beautiful day, and I guess we should all be outside, but for a couple of hours, we can sit here. Um, just on a note, I joined the club exactly 50 years ago this month. So before I start, I just want to introduce a few people. We've got a few people who played a big role in the club um, 50 years ago. Bruce and Margaret Fraser, Ted Mills, um, Will Twelker, um, uh, Lloyd Gallagher, and Ron and Ed Matthews. So please welcome the... And some of them actually, I think Ron uh, um, was in the group that uh, that found the site for this club. So, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, good. Okay. Um, so this is the old clubhouse. It was up on Sulphur Mountain, that road uh, along the road up to where the gondola and the Upper Hot Springs uh, are. Um, the club was formed in 1906, and actually, the next year at the camp in Paradise Valley, they decided to build a clubhouse already. Like, they just got going really quick. Uh, the clubhouse was built, I think it was the winter of 1908, 1909, because it opened on July 1st, 1909. And uh, it was built for about $8,000. 6000 came from the members approximately, um, and they all chipped in, $25, $50, $100, and they got what was called a debenture, which meant they were going to be paid back their money with a little bit of interest, but most um, most of them never cashed in the debenture. They ended up just giving the club the money. Another $2,000 came from the dealer, who was one of the founders of the club, and I've actually seen the document. He gave $2,000 to building the clubhouse, and he took out a mortgage. So I've seen the mortgage document, but whether he ever collected on it, I, I haven't run across that. So about $8,000 to build this beautiful looking building. But to describe it, it's easier to say what it did not have than to say what it did have. So it did not have a proper foundation. It had no insulation. <coughs> It had no electricity, no wiring. It had no running water. It had no heat except two fireplaces, as far as I know. Um, yeah, it had no indoor toilets, no running water. Um, but it was a beautiful building, and it was beautiful inside, uh, with a big library upstairs and a huge fireplace on the main floor. And people, the members loved the clubhouse. Um, it was a big hit right from the beginning. People actually ate in the early days in the dining tent, a big dining tent. And they slept in what were called tent cabins. So a combination of campus and wood. And you know, there were a lot of them. Um, it, it, it was a busy, it was, it's about a two and a half acre site that they had. Um, and they had, uh, well, the tent cabins were replaced in 2829 with wooden cabins, wooden sleeping cabins that had little, little airtight heating stoves in them. And actually, I, I should have brought it today. I didn't. I've got an art, a, a survey drawing of the site. There are 25 different structures on the property, all identified. I think it was done by either the survey design. But anyways, there were about a dozen main sleeping tents, staff quarters, all that sort of stuff. So a big place. Uh, it was very popular, very successful. Had troubles, of course, during the war. It was shut down in 1943. During the war, all of that shut down. Uh, started having troubles with a shifting foundation. Um, and uh, so by maybe the 40s, they were starting to have problems. They were looking at having to fix it up. Well, that just carried on through the 50s and into the 60s. 
Uh, and they didn't know quite what to do with it. They, they would like to have fixed it up, but it didn't even have a proper foundation. It had no proper insulation. It was never proper for winter. Uh, so they didn't know quite what to do. They got Philippe de La Salle, the architect, uh, to uh, draw designs for a new structure that would hold about 100 people. Um, they had a budget of about $200,000. And Ted, you were on the board at that time. It was presented to Parks, and Parks just said a flat out no. Um, the reason was is that that area up there was not zoned for accommodation, um, I think. And, uh, and so the Alpine Club was turned down, so they couldn't build a new building. The old building would have been very difficult to repair. And so uh, Phil Dowling at that time was president, and he, along with his board, took it to the membership to uh, what to do with it. Um, and uh, the club voted, they quite clearly they voted, I've seen the numbers, to sell and just get rid of it and go somewhere else. They did think about going to Lake Louise. There was a big project called Village Lake Louise happening in the early 70s. But that didn't work out. That never happened. And, uh, but they were offered $70,000 by National Parks. Um, you know, even if they got permission to build a new place, they didn't have the money. Why would they come up with $200,000? So, but Parks offered them $70,000 to take back the lease. And the club came up with this piece of property that I think played a role. He worked actually in the Premier Peter office at the time. Ron, uh, Ron Matthews, and uh, who else was here on that trip? Somebody was, um, anyways, they, uh, um, they walked out here in 71, I guess, and found, found this site. They walked along here, about five of them. And they found this site. The province gave the site, as far as I can tell. Like, there was no cash payment. And so they got this beautiful piece of land. And uh, they decided to build a clubhouse here, this event, which they did. Um, they went to um, Philippe and asked him to design a nice uh, a building. Philippe, of course, French, grand ideas, larger than life person. And uh, he, uh, he came up with this grand design for a clubhouse right here and presented it to the club. But it was just too grand and too expensive. The club couldn't afford it. Um, and Dave Fisher, who was president of the club at the time, said to Philippe, he said, can you scale it down a little bit? Something a little more modest. But Philippe, did, he liked his grand designs, and he said, no, I can't do it. So it was really Dave Fisher through his, he was in Toronto, and he worked for a big engineering company called Proctor and Redford. And uh, they actually designed and, and supervised the construction. Um, as far as I can tell from the documents I've read, an architectural assistant by the name of George Singleton actually drew up the plans. His name comes up, although it doesn't exactly say that, but I think he was the guy. Drew up the plans. A guy by the name of Franz Doff, who was Hans Moser's great buddy back in Austria. Franz Doff was the contractor, and he built the place. And it was all overseen by club members, four of them who were all senior engineers. So there was Phil Dowling, Don Forrest, who was an electrical engineer, Mike Simpson, and Dave Fisher. And they were all very senior engineers. And they were the committee that oversaw it. Franz built it. And uh, in the summer of 1972, uh, they had $70,000 from parks. They raised another 40000 And the total cost was $110,000. And, uh, and then it opened the next spring, I think exactly 50 years ago, in the spring of 1970. There were a, a few um, people who acted as custodians briefly. 
Uh, Jan and Toby Burks with uh, Jordy, their son Jordy, I think, very briefly. Um, but then, pretty quickly, a guy by the name of Dennis Demontney took over, and he was custodian for almost 10 years, up to 1984. Uh, Dennis was a bachelor, a bit gruff, uh, not the most sort of welcoming guy, and of course that's what you want, the custodian and the host. And he, over the years, he tended to treat the place as his own. And, uh, a story I think I got from Mike Mortimer is the Calgary section was up here having a party one night, and Dennis called the police. <laughs> I think Mike told me that story. But anyways, uh, and the club, the, the hut, or the, the club was just never really caught on financially. Um, it, and it, it lost money. And I think it was 83 or 84, the clubhouse lost um, uh, $8,000 that year. It was a real brain. The club uh, board had voted to sell the clubhouse, just get rid of it. It was a pain of money. And Peter Furman took over as president and in 84, and he wasn't having any of that. And uh, a guy by the name of Jim Murphy took over as the head of the clubhouse committee, and he wasn't having any of that. And he said, give us a year, and we'll turn it around. And they fixed it up. They did a lot of work, landscaping, advertising. And they hired a new custodian. Dennis was let go, and they hired Danny Barrel and his wife, Mel Cook. And Danny and Mel moved in upstairs into a little custodian's room. They had their daughter, um, uh, uh, Jasmine. Jasmine. They had their daughter, Jasmine. So the three of them lived in one room, didn't even have a toilet up there. And, but Dan and Mel were so welcoming. And, and they just changed that atmosphere. And you know, pretty quickly the place started to make money and uh, they did turn it around and it, it wasn't sold. And, uh, and then of course in 88, they, they rented the clubhouse out to the Olympics. They got $70,000 for a month's rent. Yeah. And that's the start of the endowment fund. Um, and then uh, the next big change was, uh, 92, 93, and they moved the offices in here. The offices had been in Banff, in the Dave White block on Banff Avenue, but they were just too small and, and they were old and, and didn't work very well. And uh, they moved the offices out here, and they've been here ever since. The clubhouse um, has survived, of course. It, it, um, probably took a big boost when it became part of Hostel and International. And now uh, it's a busy little place. The office has been here for 30 years. Think of all the money that the club has saved in rent. For 20 people and all that maintenance team, um, it's, it's been a big savings for the club. And it's worked, and here we are. So that's a little history of our clubhouse. So that's the first part of the show. Second part of the show they asked me to do was my experience with the Alpine Club because it's my 50th anniversary. So I put together an actual little slide show. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll talk about me and the club, <laughs> and we'll see if this works. Hey, it did. There it is. So uh, we'll go back to, uh, well, we're actually going back to 1960. So I first went to the mountains in May of 1962, and I went with the Youth Hostel Association up to Parker Ridge, and I fell in love with the mountains. We were ski touring up there. Fell in love with the mountains. And very quickly, it just became my whole world. Uh, within five years, uh, me and my pals, Donnie Gardner, uh, Neil Liskey, and Charlie Locke were skiing the Great Divide Traverse. I had only been on a glacier maybe three or four times, and we ski. So there's Charlie going across the Columbia Ice Fields. There's the famous picture of us. 
have been 21 days down the grid by a fabulous trip, and still the best trip in my life. Amazing picture. One photograph was taken, one swan. <laughs> Worth it. I mean, nowadays with digital cameras, you take 100. Yeah. And one taken, and it worked. Um, later that winter, uh, me and Donnie and Eckhart Grassman did the winter ascent. Uh, first winter ascent in Mount Assiniboine. So, yeah, I was into climbing. And, and those years, I was a member of the Calgary Mountain Club. I have to, <laughs> uh, to be honest, the Alpine Club was perceived by some of us as being a little bit stodgy. <laughs> yeah, it has changed. Yeah. And I don't want to insult anybody. Anyways, so in 1968, I went to Chamonix. This is, there's the post office, Corinne. I'm sure you know. It has changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love the Alps. I, of course, in those early years, I read all these books about climbing in the Alps. I went there uh, in. Uh, that's my first view of the Walker Spur coming out of the uh, the tunnel at the top of the FBB. Just, I wanted to climb in the Alps. Uh, just great rock routes and great ice routes. This is the 3,000 foot high north face of the tree lay. Just beautiful, beautiful climb. So, uh, yeah, I went there climbing in 68 and I met this guy, Dougal Haston. Um, his name is largely forgotten now, but at the time, he was probably the leading English-speaking climber in the world. Um, and he uh, he asked me to work for him as a mountain guide. I had no license. I told him I had no license. I told him I had never guided before. I didn't know what to do. And you know what he said? You know what to do. Just be careful. And, uh, so I guided for him for five years and uh, had a wonderful experience. Uh, during the winters, I came back to Canada. I love Canada. Um, and during those years of the early 70s, I loaded the strawberry tea bar at uh, Sunshine Village Ski Resort um, and worked for John Gao, who was in the audience. He was, I think, assistant manager at the time under Cliff. And uh, anyways, that winter of 72, 73, I was invited to join a British expedition to climb this mountain. This is Valley for 25,000 feet, uh, unclimbed 25,000 er in uh, Nepal. And it was a hard mountain. By this time, it had already killed six or eight people. Um, before it was eventually climbed, it killed 15 people. Uh, anyways, I was invited to join this uh, British expedition. I needed some money. So I wrote to the Alpine Club. <laughs> I wrote to Pat Boswell and I asked him if the Alpine Club could help get me to the Himalayas. And Pat was a lovely guy. And he wrote back and said, sure, we can help you. But you'll have to join the club. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, I sent him a check for $25. And he sent me a check for $250. <laughs> so I figured this is a great deal. Um, yeah. So anyways, that's how I joined the club. And then um, that's, that year, 73, was a big year for me. So in the spring, I teamed up with Donnie Gardner on the left, Dave Smith and Ron Robinson. And uh, wow. we skied the Rogers Pass to Bugaloo it had been done before in 1958. Hardly um, anybody knew about it, but we skied, skied it, had a great adventure. There's a, we got caught in a five-day storm along the way. We just sat in our tent for five days. And when the storm cleared, I got out of the tent. And smart me, I walked around here. I didn't walk across the snow, and I took one picture. <laughs> in those days it was science and we took one picture and it worked out beautifully. Anyways, so so in May we skied the Rogers Pass to Bugaloo. So that's, that's, that's the 50th anniversary right now too. Um, and then uh, and that's me uh, in my younger days. But we we had no cash, so we carried all our food on the backs. Uh, and then I went to the Alps that summer. 
Lloyd McKay and I were the Canadian representatives of the International Climbing League. And had a good season, climbed six really big routes, including the north face of the Ivory to Drew here with Lloyd. And there's a picture I took of Lloyd on a Swiss route on Lake Court. Then these were, the Swiss route was considered one of the hardest ice routes in the world at the time. And yeah, we had a good season. We sat on the top of Lake Court. We looked across, right across at the Walker Spur, and we said, we'll do that next and then we'll drive over and we'll climb the Eiger. And as we walked down into the valley, it started to rain. <laughs> and it rained for two weeks. And Lloyd had to go home. He had a real job and he had to go home. Uh, so I didn't get those two climbs, but in the autumn, I did go to the Himalayas because of the Dalgiri. And it was good value. The climbing was serious. Uh, the mountain's only 25,000 feet, but base camp is 11,000 feet, and you've got to go over top of a 21,000 or and down to a half thousand feet back up again. Mm -hmm. So climbing from bottom to top was 16,000 vertical feet. Everest is only 12,000. Mm -hmm. So it was a big mountain. Um, yeah, that's uh, carrying a, a load of food, a food box, steep terrain. Um, Unfortunately, the expedition ended unhappily. Two guys got killed, a Sherpa and one of the Englishmen. This is a cremating the Sherpa at base camp. And I, I came back to that uh, devastated uh, after that. Uh, that was really hard. So I came home to Bam. Um, yeah, I worked at Sunshine that winter again. I wrote an article. One of the things you have to do for the Alpine Club, if you get this grant, is you have to write an article. So I wrote my first article for the CAJ, and it's in there in 1974 on page one. <laughs> <laughs> the article, um, and it's called just called Dalgiri Four: An Attempt from the South. And uh, yeah, so I wrote my first article. Went back to Sunshine Village. Um, um, Oh, and I'm missing in here, yes, Dubogate in Canada that year. So before I went to the Himalayas, I asked Dougal, who I was working with that summer of 73, if he wanted to come to Canada and, uh, and show his movie. Uh, he had climbed the south face of Annapurna <coughs> in 1970, which was probably the biggest route ever done in the Himalayas at the time. And, he and Don Williams had got to the top. A film had been made about it. And uh, yeah, I had spoken to Pat Boswell. And, and so the Alpine Club hosted Dougal across Canada, very successful, the film, uh, Dougal showing his film. And uh, yeah. And then that summer of 74, I went back to the Alps. And you all recognize this guy. Yeah. I worked with Clint Eastwood the whole summer. So I, I was having an exciting life in those days. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty exciting and I went, uh, yeah, Hollywood had this, well, Clint had optioned a book called The Iger Sanctioned by a guy by the name of Trevanian. And, and anyways, they had decided to make this film and Dougal had been hired to be in charge of all the mountaineering part of it. And he asked me if I wanted to work on it. I had no idea who Clint Eastwood was. My heroes were mountain climbers, not movie stars. But I went over. I spent that summer. That the uh, that's the Hinter Soyser Traverse, just in behind me there. That's Clint on the Eiger. Uh, there they are filming a shot. You can see the, the lens of the camera right there. And uh, yeah, that scene actually is in the film. That exact scene. If you listen closely, you can probably hear the shutter on my camera. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and of course, Clint, he did some fabulous stunts. This is the scene where he cuts the rope. Uh, yeah, I used to do slideshows on, on the Iger Sanctuary. It was fabulous work. So anyways, yeah, I spent that summer of 74 there, and then... Uh, uh, I came back to BAM, um, and I gave 
a slide show for the album. <laughs> right here in this room in 1974, the clubhouse had just opened, and I gave a slideshow on filming the Irish Sunshine. Say four. And then later that winter, so in the autumn of 74, I gave a winter <coughs> sanction show, and then in the winter of 75, this got me over. This is Kurt Deenberg. So, Ron, you were in Calgary. You were chair of the Calgary section at the time. And you asked me to invite somebody else. Because Google had been so successful, you asked me to invite somebody else to do a lecture tour. And I had just read Kurt's fabulous book, Summits and Secrets. So, uh, yeah, so I invited Kurt and he came over. Ed remembers that all very well. And yeah, Kurt fell in love with the Rockies and we all got to know him very well. Uh, so, 75 in the winter, uh, Kurt was here and, and, that, and I actually got involved with the Upland Club. I joined the executive of the band section. It was called the band section in those days. It was just two, three years old. And, uh, and that was the winter that we came up with the idea for the Mountain mm -hmm. Film Festival. There was Evelyn, John and Matt, Patsy Murphy, and Betty Ware, I think, and me uh, in the room. I think that uh, we, were, uh, we were the executive of the band section, and we were brainstorming about what we might do to promote mountaineering. And somebody, John and Matt, or possibly myself, we suggested, why don't we have a film festival? We've got the band center, the town is quiet in the autumn, so uh, anyways, the idea came up. Um, I didn't have anything to do with it. John and Matt and Patsy and Ed uh, ran with the idea. And it was, to a large extent, I think an Alpine pub undertaken for a while. I think that, that was very important. Um, I actually had the worst summer of my life in 1975, some of you will remember that. I got very sick. Um, I ended up in the hospital for two months. And I moved back to Calgary when I came out of the hospital. And I left there. Um, yeah, it was a terrible time for me. Um, but I wasn't done with the memories. Um, so 1976, I skied the Northern Selkirk, skied Traverse with my pals. And then in 1978, I went up to the East Ridge Mount Bowling with John Jones and Trevor Jones and Don Chandler and we climbed that fabulous ridge there. 14,000 vehicle feet from bottom to top. Um, there it is. We did it alpine style. This is what it looked like. We started out with a pack like that on our back and we just went to the top. 50 pounds on our back. And we just went straight to the top and straight down. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I wasn't done with mountains. I was going again. And then I did it again. You know, too much partying, too much alcohol. You know, it was the rock and roll sort of life. Right? And uh, yeah, and we were we were playing hard and playing hard. And I ended up in the hospital again in 1979. Mm -hmm. And when I came out, I was shot. I did, and it took me almost 10 years to recover. I lived in this house in Southwest Calgary uh, for the next nine years until 1988 and got my strength back. Uh, I worked at the university teaching the biology labs, uh, but I got my spirit back and in 1988 I went up to this mountain <laughs> with uh, Ken Waller and Tim Fries. And This is the south face of MacArthur Peak a subsidiary peak of Logan, and that face is 8,000 feet up the top. And the three of us climbed it in five days up and down. Sort of my last really great climb. Um, it was a great climb, we had a great time, uh, and it was very successful. And then in the autumn, I had my launch party. I was going back to the mountains. Well, Calgary section is 10, there we are sitting there. And I made lots of friends, that's in my friends ever since. Mm -hmm. And there we are at the end of uh, uh, a week in the battle range. 
Um, and then the next year, I opened an account in the gold range, and here we are on top of the uh, floor at uh, that camp. And I organized a bunch of courses for that. So I hired a guide for me. I put everything together, but I hired a guide to actually teach. Dave Smith is teaching Crevasse Rescue here. This is 1989, a course called the Complete Ski Mountaineer across the Loft Ice Field. And there we are at Loft Lodge. And then uh, 1989, uh, the Complete Alpinist. Here's Dan Griffiths teaching class. There we are up on um, Mount Victoria, coming down off Mount Victoria. And uh, there we are on Mount White, and that's 1990. Yeah. And I met this young woman. She had just taken up mountaineering, Willa Harrison. And she came to one of those camps and fell in love with the mountains. And I started the youth camp. Um, so we did two of them at the Wheeler Hut with young kids, teenagers. This is on the way up to Sapphire Hall. And there's the group. Uh, we had just climbed Mount Castor. And there we are back at the Wheeler Hut. Um,